Hi, I'm Zor. Welcome to Inusor Education. Um, I would like to continue talking about statistical approach to um, unknown uh, distribution of random variables. Um, this lecture is part of the advanced mathematics course presented on unizor.com. I suggest you to watch this lecture from the website rather than from YouTube where it's linked to um, because there are some notes for each lecture and also the whole um, website has a very important educational functionality. Um, you can enroll in certain courses, you can take exams, etc. All right, so back to statistical distributions. Now, before, uh, in the prior lectures, we were addressing Bernoulli variables. Bernoulli variables are probably the most simple um, uh, random variables in theory of probabilities because there are only two values which they can take, and there is only one parameter, the probability of taking one of these values. The other one would be 1 minus that probability. So one single number actually defines the distribution. Now we will go to slightly more complex case. What if our random variable takes different, many different values? And how to approach statistically uh, to these cases? And I have decided to separate this whole problem of statistical distribution of random variables into four sub-problems or sub-tasks. Um, and uh, they are similar in some way, but uh, it's still kind of an increased complexity, if you wish. The simplest one is the following. So this is, let's say, case A. Case A is when my random variable C can take certain number of fixed values and we know exactly what these values are what we don't know is we don't know the probabilities example for instance you are rolling a dice a regular cubicle dice it has six uh, sides and uh, so basically the results are one two three four five six that's it uh, actually, Bernoulli variable also belongs to this category because there are only two cases, one and two, um, which I it usually is like one and zero, for instance. Um, and there are some other cases when you definitely have um, the theoretically possible values our random variable takes, and you don't know the probabilities which you would like to evaluate statistically. So, that's the first uh, task. The second task is when we don't know discrete values, let's consider this is a discrete random variable, which most of the variables which we are dealing are discrete actually, but we, we consider this is a discrete random variable, but we don't know what kind of values it might take. Um, for instance, uh, you can talk about, for instance, um, number of uh, car accidents uh, in the country during uh, certain months, for instance. All right, so it, it's certainly no less than zero, but you don't really know the upper bound. So the numbers can be basically anything. Uh, it can be 25, it can be 377. Uh, you never know, basically. So this is the case when discrete random variable takes unknown values with unknown probabilities. Now, the next two cases are with continuously um, con continuous random variables, which can take continuous range of values. Um, for instance, um, yes, and there are two cases again. So one case is that this is continuous, let's say, from A to B. So we have upper bound and lower bound of our variable. Um, for instance, um, you are measuring a water temperature. Well, it's definitely greater than freezing and less than the boiling, right? So it's a continuous variable, um, but it definitely has certain limits. Now, as far as um, the case number D, 
where it basically a continuous variable which does not have any limits, any reasonable limits, let's put it this way. And we have to be able to address each of these cases with certain um, uh, procedure, with certain strategy, uh, provided we are experimenting with these variable, we have to evaluate the probabilities in, in each of these cases. And that's what I'm going to address right now, very briefly. Okay, case number, case A. Now, what do we do? Well, we obviously start in this case and in every other case with n experiments. Now, if you have n experiments and you definitely know which values our variable in theory can take, you can actually have numbers. It took value x1 n1 times, uh, value x2 n2 times, etc., and value xk n k times. Now, obviously, sum of these is equal to n, because this is the number of experiments. Now, what's my approximation for the probability pi of taking the value xi? Well, I don't know it, but the frequency, empirical frequency, is obviously ni divided by m, right? So, this is the frequency, and as we know, um, the probability is actually, I mean, it's one of the ways to define the probability as a limit of frequencies of occurrence of a concrete event. So, if event is c took the value xi, then this event has a frequency ni uh, lowercase n i divided by n among our n experiments. Now, some of these can be zero because it just didn't happen. Obviously, if you roll the dice, for instance, ten times, maybe number two will not happen at all. Is it possible? Yes, it is possible. Maybe it's less probable than when it will happen, but it's still possible. And if you roll the dice less than six times, there is definitely something missing, right, in one of those numbers. So, in any case, some of these numbers can be zero, and we should not be dis uh, discouraged about this. It means that our approximation of the corresponding probability is zero. Um, maybe with number of experiments increasing, this number will not be equal to zero. But in any case, this is the best we can do. And this is the main approach how to solve these problems. So, let's stop on this. I'm not going to um, talk a lot about uh, the quality of this approximation. So it looks like it's a correct approximation because it's a frequency, and frequency is supposed to tend to, uh, it's tending to, uh, to the probability. But that's as much as I can say right now. Now, let's go to the number two. Now, in this case, we don't have the values at all. So we don't know what this particular random variable can, in theory, take. But we do know what it took. It took x1 value n1 times, x2 value n2 times, etc., and x uh, m with n m times. That we do know because we have conducted certain experiments, so we do, so we, we do have the values. So the values it took during our n experiments. It doesn't mean it's all the values which this particular variable can theoretically take. It just took these values, and obviously the sum of these, n1 and 2 and, and m, is e equal to capital N, the number of our experiments. Now, here is an example. If this is, for instance, the number of car accidents during the months of, let's say, February in the United States or something, um, then, obviously, in, in some experiments, in some Februarys, out of the last century, let's say, we could have 300, and then some of them would be 700 and uh, 357 or whatever else. Obviously, we will not have each number hit certain number of times. We will, have, we will hit certain numbers, certain number of times. Now, does it mean that our 
um, distribution is really this particular uh, uh, discrete distribution which took only values 357, 753 and 127 let's say I mean just for the, for the, for the, for the sake of uh, just the first three experiments well obviously not so how can we approach this well the way how um, I can suggest and that probably makes sense is the following you can take the minimum and the maximum from this let's say minimum is 100 and the maximum is 757 then you can probably divide it in equal parts how many equal parts well it depends um, with lower number of equal parts it will give you probably um, better numbers here but it will not be representative enough as far as the distribution for instance you want to only two categories like from 100 to uh, 400 and then from 400 to 800 something like this you might round it obviously so everything all these ends which belong to this would be in this category let's say you will have out of a hundred experiments you will have uh, 67 of these and 33 of these so you can say that with probability 67 percent your number of accidents would be from 100 to 400 and with probability 33 percent it will be from 400 to 800 now if you will divide it a little bit finer let's say instead of two you will have four like 250 then uh, 250 to 450 uh, 1 2 and 450 to 600 and 800 something like this it's not even probably it would be better if I will have even numbers in this case what I will do I will do the following you can have from 0 let's say to 1000 and then you can divide it in like 200, 400, 600, and 800. And these are intervals. So now you see how many of these fall into this category, how many to this, to this, to this, to this category. So you have one, two, three, four, five different categories. And you can say that with the probability, for instance, here you will have, um, let's say, 10 out of 100 cases and you will have 15 here you will have 10 again you have 5 here and you have 5 here or something like this but sum is supposed to be equal to 100 then you can say that again the frequency is used as an evaluation of the probability then you could say that the probability for your number of accidents to be in this range is uh, 1 tenth right and 15 uh, hundreds in this etc etc <coughs> so that's an approach which can be suggested in case when you don't really know the real numbers now um, what's interesting about this well the more the finer you divide your um, uh, range from minimum to maximum well the problem is the smaller numbers you will have for each particular category and the smaller numbers mean less precision obviously now if you divide it more crudely let's say in only like three categories from 0 to 350 from 350 to 700 and from 700 to 100 uh, to 1000 then numbers will be greater because there will be more cases falling into each particular categories categories are wider so number of cases would be greater so the precision would be better for each particular probability but now you have to question yourself is it a good division I mean is it not too crude from like 0 to 300 it means we don't really know whether it's closer to 0 or closer to 300 and it depends on 
practical implementation, practical uh, purpose of whatever the research you're doing. So it's all kind of a judgment call. But anyway, this is an approach which you can take. I don't think it makes sense to say that our random variable takes only these values with these probabilities. I mean, n1 divided by capital N, etc. probability. Because most likely, if you don't know really what kind of theoretical values random variable can take, most likely can take some other values, not only these which it already took. Okay, let's go on. The next case is this one. So we have a continuously, um, uh, we have a variable with, with con uh, c continuous uh, range of values and we don't know the distribution of probabilities, obviously, and this is a continuous distribution, which means basically we have to really talk about um, the density of probability, so to speak. So it's like normal, for instance. Well, normal is, an, is not a, a good example because it doesn't have boundaries A and B, but what if it's something like this would be? So from, let's say, A to B, and this is the density of probability, which means that the probability to get between A, uh, between this uh, capital A and capital B would be the area of this, um, uh, of this domain. And the total area underneath this density of probability curve is 1, obviously. So, um, if you have a case like this, now, you obviously don't have infinite number of experiments. You still have n experiments, and you still have certain number of um, uh, values which it took, um, not even necessarily uh, multiple times, because it's continuously distributed variable. So all of them can be, can be different, and, and the numbers can be actually all ones. So how can, we, how, how can you evaluate the probability? Well, you do exactly the same as we did before. We know maximum and minimum, right? So we subdivide it into parts. And then we just count how many of these values falling between these, how many falling between these, these, this, this, and this. And that's how we will get new numbers. Let's call it number M1, M2, etc., M uh, whatever, okay, doesn't matter. So knowing how many times your variable um, value was in between these, 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 and these, and these categories, then you can say that the probability of my um, random variable to be between, let's say, this and this, is this number divided by capital N number of experiments. So you are artificially uh, how should I say it? <coughs> it's not a discrete variable, but you're making it like discrete, if you wish. So you are uh, you know, making a, a, a quantum increase of the value um, uh, as, as, a, as a base for, um, for converting this variable into a variable which it's not really with discrete values, but, but with values which are between uh, 1 and 2, 2 and 3, 3 and 4, etc. So you're kind of approximating the um, uh, continuously distributed random variable with discrete um, uh, distribution. And in this case, you can build a graph. By the way, similar graph into the previous case also can be, can be built. So this is, for instance, number of cases for each category, and you have something like this, right? So this is uh, A, this is B, this is A1, A2, etc., AK, and these are probabilities which are actually the number of times our values were in between these uh, boundaries, well, divided by the total number of experiments. So this resembles the uh, 
the density of probability function for um, a continuously distributed random variable. Okay, the next is this one. So again, it's continuously distributed and you have absolutely no idea about the range or at least you don't have an idea about one of the boundaries, either lower or upper. Um, just for instance, um, if you will take uh, distance between two different cities in Europe. Well, obviously lower bound is zero, you know that. But as far as the upper bound, it doesn't really make sense uh, to have an entire size of Europe from, you know, from Spain to Ural Mountains to be your upper boundary because you definitely know that this is not practical. Cities are, are, are much closer than that, uh, than that distance. So it doesn't really make sense to have this big uh, distance as, as an upper limit. You just don't have upper limit. You just have to agree that you don't have upper limit because there is no reasonable upper limit. So what to do in this case? Well, you do exactly the same as I suggested here when you have discrete values with unknown values, discrete random variable. You take the minimum and the maximum from whatever you have. So you measure whatever hundred different distances, you know your minimum and you know your maximum. Well, in case of a minimum, you probably can reduce it down to zero, but maximum definitely should not be increased up to the size of Europe. So you have uh, artificially um, assumed um, uh, upper and lower boundaries as the minimum and maximum from your sampling. So basically then the problem is reduced to the same thing as we had before because we have chosen A and B, our range from and to, from practical experimentation rather, from, rather than from theoretical knowledge like in this case for instance I was talking about temperature of the water from freezing to boiling, I mean that's obviously a very reasonable boundaries. It really can be as close to zero as possible and as close to boiling point as possible, right? So it's reasonable boundaries. In this case, when there is no reasonable boundaries, just take the minimum and maximum from your, sam from, from your, from your samples. The problem, if your sample is not representative enough, if you don't have like 100 different distances in different European um, uh, countries, uh, that's probably good enough. But if you have only 10 and the country is, let's say, only uh, Italy, let's say, and you don't pay attention to other countries, most likely your uh, sample is not representative enough. So, well, again, statistics is not a precise science. I mean, it, it might be a precise science, but it's only under certain special circumstances when it's a, a, a pure theory of statistics. Practical statistics is not precise, it's not real science. There is a lot of intuition which you have to introduce into this. And that's very important. Again, if you take too small number of experiments, like in case of a distance it's like 10, 10 and that's it, that would not be representative enough. If you have a lot, well, obviously the more you have the better you will be off and your precision will be greater for evaluation because you will probably cover almost like all the cases. But well, you probably, um, you, you, you want to arrange only a sample of the data rather than all the possible distances among all the uh, different cities in, in Europe. It's too much of a task, right? So the size of this particular it depends on again the precision you would like to to be and uh, and and again it's kind of a judgment call what is the certainty level my statistical um, evaluation is supposed to be that that's the most important question how precise and how certain I should be about this precision so if you remember in Bernoulli variable we had a margin of error and we had a certainty factor or a probability that you are estimate is good within the margin of error. That's basically the same thing. Now we will talk about the details of uh, these cases, probably not each of them, because they're all kind of a look-alike, so most likely we'll concentrate on, why, uh, on this one, I guess, um, which is kind of most, uh, I mean, it's the simplest among them, but it's representative enough to evaluate the quality of our approximation. So we will we will do that in some time, and um, 
today I just wanted to introduce you to real practical cases when statistical evaluation is important and approaches we, we can actually take depending on the case um, in question. Well, that's it for today. Thank you very much. I do suggest you to um, to go to the website Unizor and if you register then you will basically open the whole functionality of the website for you including the exams which I believe is very important. That's it. Thank you very much and good luck. <laughs>